What's that knocking at your door? Who would possibly be calling your name from outside your window at 3 a.m.? It seems there might be something terrifying just outside the safety of your own home. Over the past few months, I've covered some truly creepy encounters with alleged skimwalkers and wendigos. Here is over an hour of the creepiest stories sent to me over the summer of 2018. My mom grew up near northern Wisconsin, and she told me some of her old stories a while back, which happened to her, her brothers, and their area. And some of them, I feel, are worth mentioning. I've had my own paranormal experiences, which I feel are quite difficult to talk about. And I've talked about a few of them in the past. Maybe I'll share some more. For some backstory on my family, my mom grew up rather poor on a junkyard in the country in northern Wisconsin. For anyone who isn't familiar with Wisconsin, this is the part of Wisconsin that tends to have long stretches of forest and a lot of beautiful nature and scenic views. One of the stories my mom told me was something that happened to a family that had apparently lived nearby. There was a family driving through the forest and eventually their car broke down. This would have been in the 70s or 80s, before cell phones were widespread, so they ended up going out of their vehicle and making the journey home on foot. Eventually, however, they started to notice sounds from behind them, as if something was following them through the woods, or perhaps more aptly put, stalking them through the woods. When they ran, it ran. When they stopped, it stopped. Eventually, they were able to get to their house. However, when they quickly entered, slammed the door and locked it, whatever was following them gave them a bellowing scream. Apparently the family had alerted my grandfather as to what happened, and he told them to look in his fields. According to my mom, he had apparently came back into the house wide-eyed and alarmed, but he didn't elaborate on what he saw. I vaguely recall my mom talking about seeing some sort of glow in the field though. I'm unsure if it's related, but my oldest uncle went horseback riding with a friend, and they apparently came across a thing. Apparently it was white, and when they saw it, it ran off. It stood up on its hind legs, bounced on a fence, and was gone. Apparently, it left behind some fur, which my uncle apparently collected. But this would have been many, many years ago, and my uncle died when I was about four years old in a bad accident. So I'm unable to ask him about the story. I'm unsure if both of these stories are related or not, and there could be some natural causes to this. Black bears, wolves, dogs, etc. All could be and would be living in the area. However, judging by the tone of the story, and the fact that such animals are rather commonplace and it was apparently during the day, I'm not sure if it would be mistaken identity or not. What does interest me though, is the stories of the Wendigo, which I have heard some depictions being somewhat furry from Canada. Skimwalkers and the Wisconsin's Michigan Dogman could maybe be related, I don't know. If it was not a case of mistaken identity, I don't really care to find out either. Just be careful in the woods, Mother Nature can be a cruel mistress, and there is darkness in this world be it supernatural or the very, very real deaths of human depravity and cruelty. Protect yourself and your loved ones. I work as a paramedic in Louisiana. Needless to say, after being in this profession for a while, you'll see your fair share of creepy things. However, nothing I've experienced could top this. The unit that I work on is quite rural compared to most others in our fleet. It was a busy night, so we were posted at a halfway point between our station and another in town to cover both parts of the area. We like to post off the road about a quarter of a mile into the woods so we would not be bothered while we were there. It was late, so my partner and I got into the back of our unit because there is much more room to stretch out and relax in the back. My partner was asleep and I was messing around on my phone. I felt something bump into the side of our unit, shaking the whole truck. 
Now, our trunks are heavy, and it would take a substantial amount of force to shake it like I had felt. I woke my partner and told him, but he brushed it off, thinking I may have been dreaming or something. Then it happened again. He immediately shot up and looked out the window, and I did the same. We couldn't see a thing outside, and it was too dark. We made the decision to cut on the unit floodlights, which illuminate the entire area around the truck. I moved from the window to hit the button, and my partner stayed behind looking out the window. As soon as I turned them on, my partner gasped and jumped back from the window. I could see it as well. The light from the back of that unit illuminated an approximately seven foot tall creature. It looked like it was turned around, but I could not make out a face. Most of it was hairless, but I did see some matted patches of hair here and there on its body. It had extremely long, skinny arms that appeared to drag the ground behind it. The parts of the body that were hairless appeared to be gray and wrinkly. It wasn't moving, just standing there with its back towards us. We decided to radio dispatch and told them to get a police unit to our location as there was a large animal outside of our unit. About five minutes later, we saw the lights from the police unit come from down the road. The creature looked in the direction of the lights, turned its body, and very calmly walked into the woods. The officer walked up to our unit and opened the door. We explained to him what was going on. He said that he didn't see anything as he was pulling up and whatever it was was gone now. It's been a few months since seeing this creature, and I've never seen or heard anything like it and I have not seen it since. Granted, we don't park in that area anymore. Needless to say, we have stayed in the front of the truck now when posting, ready to floor it and drive away if anything like this happens again. Here in Canada, I have in-laws way up north in a place called the Northwest Territories. They're native and have a lot of weird tales from their community. They have family spread all over the north, a lot of them whom are in Alberta as well, and will play into this story. So, it was a typical winter night, maybe tenish years ago at my in-law's grandparents' house. Not that late or anything, but very dark due to that time of year, and it was way too cold to be outside. At least negative 45 Celsius or negative 49 degrees. Everyone was just uh, hanging out and watching TV. Kids were playing in a typical average kind of night, you know? Suddenly, there is knocking at the door. Hard, persistent knocking. This was immediately strange as they live away, outside of any town, with kilometers between neighbors and unannounced guests are almost unheard of. Their grandparents are visibly concerned and tell them not to answer the door. The knocking became harder, and the guests began to speak, loudly stating that they were Auntie So-and-So, and that they had been invited over. The kids wanted to answer the door to see their auntie. Apparently, it sounded exactly like her. So their grandpa had to block the kids from going near the door and tell them to get away from the door and the windows as well. The knocking became an pounding and the guest started yelling and screaming angrily to be let in. Eventually, it stopped and the guest was gone. The next morning, there were no tracks outside in the snow, and no signs of a vehicle had been in the area. This auntie lived in Alberta and had made no plans to visit. Anyway, that's about it. Not much for excitement, but that kind of shit is weirdly common out here in some places. Believe it or not, Wendigo is a major piece of folklore in that family as well, and they refuse to talk about it out of fear of drawing one in. I grew up in Flagstaff, Arizona. Many times when you would ask natives about skimwalkers, they would get upset and would mostly refuse to even mention the word. My aunt went to a basketball game with the team my uncle was training. She stepped in since he was out sick. The game was on a reservation, and they were on a dirt road heading home around 8 at night, and she said an old woman started floating next to the van 
and everyone started to scream. She told everyone in the car to pray, and she said that's when the old woman floated off into the dark. Nobody stopped praying until they got to the meeting line where she dropped off the kids. Another story was from my friend Raiden. He told me that they were at his grandma's house watching TV at night when he heard knocking on the door. He went to go answer it and his grandparents yelled at him not to, saying that nobody comes out this late except for skimwalkers. He said after that, they heard knocking on the walls and windows, and the windows had boards that you could shut from the inside, so he never saw anything. He said the next day, he heard the walker get on top of their trailer, outside, and start thomping on it. Next day they came out, the roof was dented to hell. My friend Anthony told me a story of how him and his brothers were outside with their uncle, and they saw a skimwalker with blood red eyes and pale white skin, but the face looked like a pig's. They said they sat there frozen, and they said that their uncle also froze in a spot after making direct eye contact with the walker, and the walker started walking towards them, and they said that they grabbed their uncle and dragged him inside and locked everything in the and called the cops. Some pretty terrifying shit. I wouldn't go searching for any of these things. It was around 11 p.m. at night. We wanted to visit a graveyard, so we ended up going to Double Butte Cemetery near South Mountain in Phoenix. As we were pulling in, a coyote dashed across the car and ran toward the mountains. It looked weird, like one of those overbred incest German shepherds that are all short and hunched over. But I didn't think too much of it. We parked and walked away from the car and explored the graveyard. There were no sign of people or coyotes, but whenever we walked near a bush or a tree, we heard rustling. But we figured it was just some sort of rodent or bat. When we were done, we walked toward the car to leave but we saw a cool little gated sanctuary garden type thing. So we went in there and sat for a little. All of a sudden, we heard what sounded like a weird mix of a laugh, scream, and a howl. I was confused to what this humanist scream was at first. So my mind immediately translated it to multiple coyotes, a pack. We were about to leave, and then we saw four sets of glowing eyes crouching and coming toward us fast. I still figured an angry coyote pack, so we ran to the car. After being safe in the car, we got a little more ballsy and tried to find them. They were nowhere to be seen. I saw three, maybe four shadows of human figures on the other side of the graveyard from the car. I thought to myself, wow, there are people here this late? I wonder why we didn't see or hear them. It's a pretty small, flat and treeless graveyard. Basically, just dirt and desert. So I'm pretty positive we would have known if there were others. Their shadows disappear for a while, but I'm still looking toward that direction. That's when I saw the weirdest figure, hunched over, walking in the most awkward way. The way its body moved was swift and unnatural. It was the same direction where I saw the people. We drove over to that direction and found nothing and left. We get home and we notice the car is scratched up everywhere, like a coyote was going crazy on top of the car. The scratches were long and dragged, in different directions, and a few dirt paw prints all over the car. We had a car wash the next day, and the car was completely untouched before, and I'm pretty sure of that. We also left a McFlurry in the trunk of the car, which was untouched and not moved. If coyotes got on the car, it definitely would have been destroyed, considered how dramatic the scratches were. So yeah, I'm wondering if what we saw were skimwalkers. The graveyard is also near a reservation, and it seemed like a lot of Arizona pioneers and natives were buried there. First off, I'd like to let you know it's taboo to speak of them, or the others as it brings them after you. That said, here's my story. It was 25 years ago. 
I lived on the reservation with my family, and I was out with some friends. We went down to the creek to have a day of reed picking, and we were enjoying listening to the sounds of nature. I couldn't resist trying to catch a little frog I saw. I reached out to catch it, and it hopped away. Well, as I was expecting that, I started back a bit, and I fell forward and landed against a small boulder and sprained my ankle. I tried to get up, and I couldn't because my foot had swelled up really bad. I couldn't even take off my shoe or sock at this point. My friends came over to sit with me and figure out how we were going to get back to the adobe. There were seven of us, and we were all too scared to walk back alone due to our parents always telling us never to leave each other at all costs. We were trying to think what to do when we were at a loss. We went silent for a while, and that's when we all noticed that the animals around us were quiet as well. We all thought nothing of it, and continued to think about the life and how we were going to get back to the adobe. I was apologizing for the hundredth time when we heard a noise. I jumped and screamed out in pain. My friend, she grabbed my arm and told me to put my weight on her shoulders, and then another friend joined her. I'm between two of my friends looking along the pathway when we hear another noise, kind of like a fire popping noise, and yet no fire around for half a mile. Well, we stopped and we listened, and then a smell so bad and nauseating overcame us. I'm not even sure how to say how it smelled. It was kind of dead and rotted like a fresh metallic smell mixed in with a little bit of garbage. What I'd say, this was definitely puzzling, as it wasn't no Bigfoot or anything like that. There was no wildlife we knew that smelled like that either. We were scared, and honestly, really freaked out. We decided my friend Scotty was going to investigate and find out what was causing the smell. We were fixating and arguing with him because we didn't want him to go. The smell became so strong, we all vomited and we couldn't breathe without an overwhelming, disgusting, nauseous feeling overwhelming us. You may think I'm nuts, and at this point I wouldn't blame you, but I'm telling you this right now. This is the God's honest truth. When I was able to stop the nausea and vomiting, I looked up from between my friend's shoulders and saw the most horrifying thing I have ever seen in my life. Right on a hill in front of us, about a yard and a half away, stood a skimwalker. He was starting towards us and making hardly any sound at all. We'd been warned about them and we knew we were going to have to get away from here. I decided pain or not, I was going to just suck it up and run as best as I could. I wasn't going to let my friends go down because of me. I let go of their shoulders. I took a deep breath and I started to run as fast as I could. I really don't know how or why, but I was too focused on the running from him, but I barely felt my ankle at this point. We were all at a dead run down the path across the fields and finally reached the adobe. We all ran in, gasping for breath, and my mom and my friend's moms looked at us asking what had happened to us. We were so freaked out and running, as the hounds had been after us. Well, Sarah caught her breath first and started to ramble on about what had happened. I started calming down and collapsed and cringed from my sprained ankle. My mom came over with Mary Ann, my cousin's sister-in-law, and both started to work on my ankle. I got chided for being clumsy and trying to mess with wildlife. I was so badly in pain I wanted to scream. I asked if I could have some water, and my mom gave me a little bit. She told me to drink slowly as I get sick if I drink too fast. My sister and brothers came in, and we were told to go get healing herbs from the shaman. I was passing in and out of awareness and I could barely hear bits and pieces of my friends telling their stories about our ordeal. I must have passed out since when I woke up I was in my bed and my mom was sitting in a corner churning bread to cook for dinner. She immediately came to my bedside and said the shaman had been here to see me and he said I'll be fine. We all should be okay. He didn't think we were affected by the bad spirit, but we need to follow orders in order to stay safe from now as he thinks it may be a warning to us. I still wonder to this day who he was and why he was warning us and about what. I will never know. 
but I since then have moved and grown up. But I never have and never will mess with wildlife for any reason unless it's to save a life. I'll just watch it from a distance and enjoy its beauty. I'm not in any hurry to be punished by the evil spirit for doing evil things. I prefer to be an okay person and to just worship our great spirit, our creator. You may not believe me, but I will tell you this one. Don't speak about them, and don't let them possess you or kill you. Never in my life could I predict something like this would ever happen to me. You're probably wondering if I experienced a traumatic event such as a mugging, home invasion, car accident, or probably that I received shocking news from my doctor that I have some sort of cancer. Honestly, I would have preferred any of those events compared to the horror that I recently faced. Before I go any further, Understand that I'm not crazy, nor am I under the influence of any mind-altering drugs. No one around me believed anything that happened, nor what I saw that night. So my words are all I have as I give my recollection within this story. Cindy was an extraordinary girl. Beautiful as a rose, and always kind-hearted since the day she moved in next door. We met when we were both kids and she would often come visit me to play and hang out, or vice versa. Both my parents and hers would become close. The more Cindy and I's friendship grew, that was. By our mid-teens, we were officially a couple, a perfect match. After high school, we both went to different colleges, but our bond and love for each other was still strong despite the distance between us. Now, in our 20s, I was offered the job that I had been desperately yearning for in Los Angeles. Since we lived in New Mexico, I obviously had to relocate. Although I had my own place, Cindy was still living with her parents at the time while working at a daycare. The last thing I wanted to do was disrupt her future career plans, but I loved her way too much to be away from her. So I asked her to come with me, despite this being the first time she'd be away from her home and her parents, she willingly agreed. I decided to first take a trip out to California to meet my new boss and more importantly find a new apartment within the city closer to work before I officially moved there. Both Cindy and I chose to make a vacation out of it and a road trip out west. We left early that morning, hoping to reach our destination within a couple of days. Everything had a joyous feel about it. We were both excited and overall happy about starting our new lives. The morning had soon turned to evening. As we crossed the state line into Arizona, it made our way through the more deserted and rural areas. It was nearing the end of the day, as dusk finally set in. We were the only people, or so it seemed, driving down the highway with the vast desert and darkness surrounding us. I could only see as far as my headlights would allow, when suddenly, a huge dog stepped onto the road. I swerved the car just in time to avoid hitting the animal before stopping. With the abrupt stop, I accidentally sprained my wrist against the steering wheel. However, that wasn't the odd thing about it. The dog, which caused us to steer off the road, calmly made its way in front of the car once more. Its eyes glared in the headlights as it stared undisturbed at us. Both Cindy and I were lost for words as we could do nothing but stare back in utter surprise. This encounter lasted less than a minute before the dog bared its teeth in a low grumble before turning its back to us and darting off into the darkness. Needless to say, this was beyond the doubt the weirdest thing that I had experienced thus far. Rather than dwelling on the incident, I glanced over at Cindy to tell her that she'd have to drive the rest of the way as my wrist was aching from the sprain. We pulled into a gas station off the lonely highway to get some supplies and bandages to tie my wrist. Cindy went into the rest stop while I pumped the gas. As I was waiting for Cindy to fill the tank, out of nowhere, I heard the faintest grumbling sound. I peered around but saw nothing, nothing but the dark that engulfed the desert. I peered into the rest stop to see Cindy now making a purchase from the attendant when the grumble started again. I quickly turned around, and out in the distance, 
not 50 feet away, I spotted the very same large dog. However, it took off not two seconds after it somehow realized I saw it. This was indeed freaky, considering we were at least two to three miles from any point in the highway in which this incident occurred. In no way could a dog cover that distance in such a short amount of time. I tried to convince myself that what I saw was just a mere coincidence, but eerie nonetheless. I ushered Cindy to hurry up, without raising concern, as I didn't want to freak her out. Seeing as it was already late and my wrist was aching with pain, I decided that we should just call it a day and hit the road again in the morning. There was a motel less than a mile away from the gas station of which we decided to bunk down for the night. With there being a few occupancies, we were able to get a reasonable sized room as I helped Cindy unload our luggage from the car, all the while still not mentioning the strange occurrence. As we settled in, I was able to scrounge up some ice from the motel's dispenser to try and decrease the swelling of my wrist. As I lay on the bed and tried to relax, Cindy kept rifling through her handbag in concern. As it so happened, she had forgotten her credit card back at the gas station. She was adamant about going back and getting it, as she was convinced that it might have slipped out of her purse as she rushed out of the store. She was a little worried and concerned, so I opted to go back to the gas station and see if I could find it for her, but she chose to go herself as I was in no condition to drive. I tried to convince her that I was capable of driving regardless of my hand, but she insisted. I also offered to go with her, seeing as it was late and all the weird occurrences that had happened thus far, but my efforts were futile once more. The gas station was less than a mile away and visible from our motel, so I knew Cindy wouldn't be gone long. Finally, easing the pain in my wrist with some ice, I accidentally dozed off while watching TV. When I awoke, however, it was an hour later and Cindy had not returned yet nor called. I tried reaching her, but it would continuously ring without an answer. After calling her a couple more times, but to no avail, I went over to the front desk to check with the night manager as to whether he had seen Cindy since we checked in together. Apart from seeing her leave the parking lot an hour earlier, he assured me that he hadn't seen her return. My worry soon transitioned into fear. Although the manager offered to call the police, I told him that I'd check the gas station to see if I could find her there before we alert the authorities. Cell phone usage is not promoted around the vicinity of gas pumps, so there was a possible reason she wasn't answering. I chose to walk over to the station, since it was under a mile, which would approximately take me 15 to 20 minutes if I hurried. Reluctantly. I began to trek down the dark highway guiding my path with the use of my flashlight. I tried desperately to stay positive, conceiving every possible excuse in my mind as to why Cindy had been absent for so long. The further along I went, I came across tire marks on the road as if a car had veered off the highway. Using my flashlight, I followed the irregular tracks just a few feet ahead until it trailed off the road. As I shone my light out into the darkness, off the side where the tracks led, my worst fear suddenly materialized. I saw the tail end of my car, at least 30 feet off the road. I immediately ran up to see if Cindy was inside, God forbid, badly injured due to the accident. As I came up to the driver's side of the car, it was evident that it was empty. I frantically looked around and yelled for Cindy a couple of times. As I circled the vehicle, I noticed the keys were still in the ignition. The front windshield was smashed, and the front tire was flat, but no signs of actual collision. The only other major damage to the car was a huge dent on the hood, as if someone had dropped an anvil on it. I scrambled to dial 911 on my phone, but for some strange reason, I chose to call Cindy one last time. As her phone kept ringing, I constantly was on the lookout for any cars passing by. I tried calling again, but as I was frantically looking around, a faint light caught my attention at least 20 feet from the car. I hastily approached the object on the desert floor, and as the light in question came into recognition, I realized it was Cindy's phone which I had been calling. I dropped to my knees and picked it up thinking the worst as my eyes swelled up with tears. My brief moment of grief 
I heard someone call my name further out in the distance. I stood back up and tried to listen closely as, this time, I heard my name called again. The voice became clearer as whoever was saying it was becoming closer. Focusing my eyes, I could see a figure in the distance closing in. I called out to it, but when the reply came I realized it was Cindy's voice. I bolted toward her feeling a sigh of relief. I pointed my flashlight at the figure and began to slow my pace, noticing Cindy walking toward me in a weird way. One of her legs was dragging as she propelled herself with the other, whilst one of her arms was waving at me in a kind of strange manner. At first, I thought she was hurt from the accident, but the closer I got, the more fearful I became. Something didn't seem right about her as I stopped in my tracks and watched as she extended her arm toward me and began tilting her head from side to side. Whatever this thing only a feet away from me was, it sure as hell wasn't my girlfriend. The being that appeared as Cindy kept calling my name as it moved in closer and closer. Its body began contorting in weird positions as trying to act more human. That didn't catch my attention more so than whatever it was. It also wore Cindy's clothes it looked like, except they were inside out. I slowly began to back away keeping my light on it. I can only speculate that it somehow became aware that I realized it wasn't who it was pretending to be as its eyes glared a bright red and the grumbling sound of a wild dog escaped its mouth. The gas station wasn't too far up the highway, but if I were to make it, I'd have to run like hell. Before I could even plan my escape, the thing dropped to the ground on all fours as its body began to contort more rapidly, and I even heard its limbs snap. I took that as my cue to run. The moment as I back onto the highway, I bolted toward the gas station in full speed. I could hear the creature give off a blood-curdling cry from where I left it, a cry between that of a woman's scream and the howl of a wolf. I ran as fast as my feet would carry me, all whilst the cries echoed in the dark. For a moment, I could hear the faint panting of a wild dog giving chase almost parallel to the road alongside me. Whether it was chasing me or not, I was just a few short feet away from the gas station. There were no cars at any of the pumps as I hurried into the gas station store so frantically that I tripped onto the floor the moment I burst through the doors. The attendee rushed over to me to see if I was alright, but I was more focused on whether that creature had followed. It glared at the outside and its surroundings as I stood to my feet drenched in sweat and breathing heavily. The attendee kept trying to get my attention and asking me if everything was okay, but I didn't even acknowledge him until I realized that there was no sign of that thing anywhere. I stepped outside briefly only to hear the still of silence and the occasional rustling of the desert wind. Finally, directing my attention to the gas station attendee, I immediately asked him as to whether he had seen my girlfriend return. I tried explaining that she was missing as well as being chased by some weird creature on my way here. He asked her name, but when I told him, he froze for a moment, then reached behind the counter drawer and pulled out Cindy's credit card. The same card she was supposed to return for after he handed it to me. The realization that something horrible had happened to my girlfriend settled in. I ushered him to call the police whom arrived at the gas station about 15 minutes later. I recounted everything that happened to the police except for my encounter with whatever that creature was. How could I possibly explain what I saw and not be thought of as a mental case? I was shaken to my core, but had to remain sane for the sake of finding the real Cindy. I led the police to the side of the car wreck in the motel where the rest of Cindy's belongings were. The cops launched a full search and investigation of the sudden disappearance while I was taken in for questioning that very night as being labeled the only suspect. Video surveillance at both locations revealed the time when Cindy left the motel, but never arrived at the gas station. Since I refused to recount my encounter with the fake Cindy, all fingers pointed towards me as the primary suspect, though I was ultimately released from the precinct due to lack of compelling evidence that implicated me with her disappearance. I still felt like the guilty one though. 
Had I stopped her from leaving the motel room that night, Cindy would still be here. After some time, the search officially concluded, and Cindy's name was added to the state's list of missing persons. Her parents still cling to the hope that their daughter is missing rather than dead, even months after the incident. I'm a 23-year-old woman, and I'm half Cherokee, from Georgia. At the time that this story took place, my fiancé and I were living on a large farm in Maryland. We didn't use the farm, but we were renting a small house on the property, and were free to come and go around the grounds. I was only 19 at the time that this took place, and the only other residents in our home were myself, my fiancé, and our cat and dog. Our cat was a lunatic barn cat that I'd rescued because I can't say no to animals that need help, and our dog was my loyal pit bull, who was a sweet, cuddly, scaredy cat. She weighed about 75 pounds and scared of her own shadow. Our farm was situated on about 20 acres of land, and our driveway was about a half a mile long. So usually, when I would get home from work, my loyal dog and I would go for a walk, and usually, I brought my fiancé with me. Not that I was afraid to go out alone, just that he spends too much time playing games and all. I like him using his legs. After our driveway was a 12 mile long road through the woods and farms until it finally reconnected with civilization, so it was safe to say we were far from other people, except for our landlord of course. The rest of it were miles of wheat fields and solid forest for two more miles. Now that you have a bit of layout, on to the really creepy bit. So, it started off like any other weekday evening. My fiance and I returned home from work to our happy cottage and happy pets. Harley, our dog, was frantic to go out for a walk, so I quieted her and changed her into her walking clothes and I asked if my fiance wanted to come with me. He had gotten home shortly after me and said he had seen one of the coyotes that we have had around close to the field by our house. As you may know, coyotes are mostly scavengers, especially out here on the East Coast, so I wasn't too worried, and I am very capable of defending myself. I caught him a puss, and then told Harley that we could go, and that we would be fine without him. Laughing to myself, we left the cottage and started walking toward the driveway. The sun was going down, and the October air had started to get a chill to it, and it rustled through the cornfields next to our long driveway. The corn was about six feet tall at this point in the year, and impossible to see through, so I assumed that my fiancé was just trying to scare me because there was no way he could have seen a coyote in this field. Harley was enjoying her time in the field tearing in and out of the corn stalks on her way up to the driveway. I knew that was as big of a coward as she was that she would alert me if there was any danger coming, and she would very quickly run away. By the time I reached the end of the driveway, the sun had set and the moon which had already come out was shining high about the fields. It wasn't quite full, but it provided enough light that I didn't need to use my flashlight or Harley's collar light. We turned left down the road and proceeded across the first section of the field. The first field was soybeans. If you don't know, they are relatively short plants that nothing but a rabbit could hide in. And off in the distance, I spotted a few deer but nothing alarming, so we relaxed and enjoyed our walk through the night air. I threw a stick at Harley, and she brought it back. We do this over and over again, the typical dog and owner stuff. We reached the first small section of trees, and Harley stopped and bumped into my leg, letting me know there was something ahead. It wasn't a coyote or a deer, but there was a rabbit that had been hit by a passing car and was still struggling. As much as I hate to say this, there was no way it was going to live, and honestly, it's probably what drew the coyote pack in. I knelt down by it, using my knife quickly and put it out of its misery, as my family had taught me, and let it pass into my next life. Feeling sad, but somewhat relieved that all we had encountered was a handful of deer and that poor rabbit, we continued our walk and passed into the next field. This was a wheat field, and the wheat was about ready for harvest, so it was quite tall and hard to see through. The field was quiet though, 
and Harley didn't do anything, so I figured that the coyotes had passed on if there had been any at all. Now this is the part that you have been waiting for, and I don't know what it was, but here it is. We rounded the corner of the field and into an area with wheat on our left and the forest on our right, and the air seemed to go still. Harley got closer to me, and I heard rustling in the wheat field. I saw three tails circling back towards the forest. Coyotes. The eastern coyotes are small, but in a pack, they get pretty ballsy. Harley raised her heckles, and I yelled, Get out of here! Go on! Fuck off! As loud as I could at the coyotes. They started scattering off into the trees. I decided to turn around and get out of there before they decided to regroup, because I am brave, but I'm not going to walk into a darkened forest with a coyote pack and a cowardly pit bull. We turned to head back and again I heard a rustling in the wheat. A confused coyote, maybe. I thought that it must be, but no. Harley was standing stock still staring at the wheat and I whistled for her to come to me. That high pitched ear piercing two finger whistle. That snapped her out of it for a second when my whistle was returned from the inside of the wheat. All of a sudden, all of the family legend I had heard came flooding back to me, and I expected to see a tall, thin creature emerge, but nothing did. I didn't smell rotting meat or feel a sense of dread. Instead, I was transfixed with fear and curiosity. I whistled again. The whistle was returned again. Very human-sounding, but at the same time, not. Against my better judgment, I said, Hello? My own voice replied, Hello? My hand on my knife, I said, Show yourself! Silence. No bugs, no coyotes, no Harley noises, just my own breath. Slowly, the rustling started again, and I turned on my flashlight. I shined it on the wheat field, and what I saw confuses me to this day. Animal eyes. That green-yellow reflection of light was cast back at me, but what it was connected to didn't make sense. Th there was a girl, no more than 14 or 16, crouched in the wheat. She wore what I think must have been some kind of deer skin or fur, and she was naked otherwise. She, she was very thin and looked as though her skin had never seen sunlight. Her hair was long and tangled with wheat and leaves. Under any circumstances, I would have said she was beautiful, but at that moment, she was terrifying. We stared at each other for what must have been a solid minute or so, but felt like much longer, until I heard the unmistakable coyote howl from the forest. Both our heads snapped toward the noise and I immediately heard her take off through the wheat toward the sound. At that same moment, Harley took off toward our house and I went after her. We didn't stop running until we got to the driveway and I stopped not wanting my fiance to know I was running away from something. I could still hear the howling in the distance and we started walking at a brisk pace. We made it back to the cottage with no further problems and didn't tell my fiance about it as to not want him to think that I was crazy. She hadn't hurt me, so I didn't think it was right to hunt her. I was awoken in the middle of the night by the sound of coyotes outside our cottage. This wasn't unusual, but now I wondered if she was with them. When I was coming home from work about a month later, I had stopped obsessing about that night and I almost thought I had imagined it when I slammed on my brakes for something in the road. It was dark and my headlights hit its eyes and reflected green and yellow. It was a large coyote. It just stared at my car for a moment and then ran off into the woods. I know this sounds crazy, but I still wonder if that was her. I live in the Pacific Northwest and I've always been an outdoors kind of guy. I love to camp and hike and spend most of my time outside. Now, I'm not oblivious. I know to take precautions such as carrying a knife and letting someone know where I'm going. Usually, I'll go with my Bernese Mountain Dog, 
but on this occasion, I was with friends. I heard of Wendigos and all of that before, but I had not ever seen anything out of the ordinary, so I assumed they were just that, stories. Me and my friends would joke about it sometimes, the Wendigo is going to get you, but I never talked about it when going into the woods. My friends and I decided to go on a trip deep in the woods. I don't like to go to campgrounds, so that way we can really be out there. For the sake of names, it was me, my friend Anthony, and Victor. Nothing out of the ordinary occurred, although as we drove as far as we could into the woods and hiked onto the trail for about another two miles. As we hiked, I sensed something was off. I shook the feeling off as maybe an animal was around. I'm sometimes sensitive to energies. As we settled at our campground, Victor and I were taking pictures of the scenery, and Anthony, of course, was helping himself to his 12-pack of beer. I know, alcoholic or not. Nah. Anyways, as the night carried on, Anthony began ranting about some girl who broke his heart and getting all into his feelings, and I tried to change the subject by telling some scary camping stories. In the middle of a story, we heard some branches crack nearby, and I got silent. I do this to see if it's an animal like a bear. Victor then said, Maybe we should try to make some noises to scare it off. And Anthony, six beards in, begins loudly saying, Bro! It's probably the Wendigo! Hey Wendigo! Come get me, drink bitch! I reply, Anthony, are you one of those guys that just does stupid shit like this? Calm down, dude. We're probably on native land at this point. The national forest we were on was a borderline of a reservation. Anthony said that he was going to fuck shit up if he saw it, and talking nonsense like that. Fast forward, me and Anthony are just by the fire, while Victor was in the tent getting ready to go to sleep. As me and Anthony talk about his ex-girlfriend problems, he tells me he has to take a piss, so I go with him to make sure he doesn't fall or something. He had too many shots to even walk right. And as I'm waiting for him to finish, I hear Victor's voice, but it sounded different. Anthony, help me. It repeats this two more times, the exact same tone as if it was robotic. At this moment, I knew it was either Victor or something else. Again, I am aware of native folklore, and I know not to risk answering to whatever was calling us. I tell Anthony, did you hear that? Anthony asked me what? Nothing. Uh, I, I don't know. I wait a few more seconds, and nothing happens. Now, I took this as me being paranoid. I did smoke a little bit of weed, so maybe I was just psyching myself out. When we got back, Victor was outside by the fire telling us he can't sleep. Now keep in mind, we are in a field of grass by the tree line. I thought it was a cool spot to see the stars at night. As we talked, I saw something in the corner of my eye. A deer. I remember seeing one before finding the clearing and thought maybe it was the same one as before. Guess we had a friend following us. Well, I soon found out it was no friend. My friends saw me looking at the deer doing its thing in the field eating grass. Me looking back at my friends, guess we have a visitor. Victor said, a wendigo, laughing. And of course Anthony says, I swear if that's one I'm killing it. And he starts screaming at it again. Anthony, leave the freaking deer alone. At this point, we aren't paying attention to the deer and are just talking face to face by the fire. When I glance back and the deer was gone. Like, not gone from the spot, but vanished. At the time, I didn't think much of it. But then, Anthony gets up and shouts, WENDIGO! And as soon as he says it, I see the deer peeking behind a tree. As I make eye contact with it, it opens its mouth and speaks. It said, in the most inhuman, distorted voice I had ever heard, Anthony! I froze. I couldn't believe what I had just seen. 
my friends noticed this and turned around to face the deer, which was standing on two legs and about eight feet tall. Its mouth opened more, revealing sharp teeth, and it screams in this maniacal laughter. We took off into the woods, not even caring about our campsite. Thankfully, we were right by the trail that we took to get there, and as I'm running faster than I ever have before, I turn to see that this thing is following us, saying, Anthony, come here. <laughs> In a demonic voice, we split up to make this thing lose us somehow, and by some stroke of luck I found somewhere to hide under a huge fallen tree and crawled into it with Victor. As we sit there staying quiet as we possibly can, we hear heavy footsteps and heavy breathing. Then luckily, they continued on. After what felt like an eternity, we got out and desperately hoped that Anthony was still around. We decided to head to the truck and thank God Anthony was there, locked inside it. We got in and got the hell out of there, but before we took off we heard the most haunting scream that echoed across the room. Safe to say, I'm never taking him camping again, and I don't think he wants to go after that experience. I uploaded a story in January and sent it to you about a possible Wendigo lurking around my house. I'm sending this to you again because it has reappeared, and I'm not sure if it's alone. This happened around April 10th. The sun was just beginning to rise, and I was walking around the property checking on all the pigs like usual. Most of them were lazing about in the hay, but I noticed as I slowly made my way out back, the pigs that were restless and making noises letting you all know now that I had a machete that I shoved in my belt at the time. That was because of an increasing issue with coyotes, as well as the paranoia from my encounter a few months prior. Wondering what the problem was, I crept as quietly as I could out back, my hand hovering over the machete's handle as I did so. Peering over the crest of the hill, I'm greeted with nothing but agitated pigs pacing in their pens. Hmm, I grunted standing up straight and making my way up to the pens. What's wrong, Latte? I asked one of the pigs, scratching her head for comfort. She kept turning her head to look at the woods, making loud squeaks and whines in the process. Looking at some of the younger pigs, I noticed that they were doing the same thing. Despite feeling nervous, it was my job to see what was bothering them. So, swallowing hard, I make my way to the tree line, peering into the woods. As I'm looking around, I hear a branch break off to my right, my head whipping around to face the sound. Practically crawling up a steep muddy ledge was what looked like the creature from before, except its pale skin was stained with what looked like blood, and it looked like it had been in a fight. One of its antlers were snapped in half, and patches of its fur and skin were hanging off of it. I must have made some sort of sound because its head turned to face me. It gazes locked into mine. The only few seconds that I got to stare at this thing felt like an eternity before it screamed at me and scuttled up the ledge as fast as it could, disappearing over the top. As soon as I couldn't see it, I hightailed it back to the house, slamming the door shut and locking it. If it was the same creature as before, I want to know what could have done that to it, but at the same time, I don't. Frankly, it terrifies me to think that there might be something else out there. Something with enough strength and guts to attack something like that. Just hoping I'm overreacting and it was hit by a vehicle and not attacked by something else. Back about 10 years or so ago, my good friend and I would occasionally take trips to her family's property out in the middle of nowhere. It was fairly remote. You'd had to drive up a dirt road a few miles and couldn't access it unless you had a key to the chain on the gate. There wasn't anyone around for miles. All that was there was a trailer they had towed up and left to sleep in. The feel out there was always a little off. One day, we were wandering around the property, not really thinking of much 
until about 20 minutes later when we realized we had actually been walking out into the middle of nowhere. We had no water with us and had no clue where we were. Luckily, we found our way back after a while, but neither of us could explain why we did that. I'd also take my voice recorder, and we caught a, quite a few strange things on it. One day, before heading out there, we were talking about Skimwalker Ranch. It was only about a 40 minute drive from the property, so we thought, hey, why don't we go try to find it? We thought it would be cool to say that we had been there. After searching the internet, we found fairly good directions there and headed out for the night. We had a bit of trouble locating it, but after a bit of driving around, we pulled into an area that was spot on from the descriptions we had read. We stepped out of the car, and the first thing we noticed was the mass amounts of bugs swarming us. Only a few short seconds later, we had huge dogs barking, growling, and running at us. We immediately jumped back in the car and took off. We ended up staying in the area for a little longer exploring. Later that night, back at her property, we were sitting around the fire talking. All of a sudden, we started hearing barking. It was rather startling and she immediately froze and said she had never heard barking in this area before. She isn't one to get scared easily, so her uneasiness put me on the edge. Not too long after that, there was more barking. Very slowly, we were being surrounded by what I assumed were coyotes. We both tried yelling, jumping around and throwing rocks, but that didn't seem to do any good. Never seen coyotes act this way. We were terrified and had no clue what to do. Not really wanting to stick around and find out if they'd get any closer to us, we doused the fire and flipped on our flashlights. She grabbed my hand and we booked it back into the trailer. We were both shaking by the time we made it in and she locked the door. I don't think either of us slept that well. I heard a lot of weird sounds and felt the sense of dread the entire night. As soon as the sun started to rise, we decided to pack up and get out of there. We needed a car, and what we saw sent chills down my spine. On the driver's side car window was a huge handprint made with mud. It was easily twice the size of our hands. We looked at each other and silently agreed that we need to get the hell out of there. I'm not saying it was a skimwalker, but neither of us have been able to explain it, and I've never been back. Some background. I live in a rural county in Texas. I live in a rural suburb about a mile and a half away from my grandparents, who live on an expansive Longhorn cattle ranch. My grandparents are currently on a trip to Michigan, and they needed someone to watch their house, take care of their diabetic dog, and water the garden for a while. I love being alone and in the country, and I wouldn't be that far from my mom and stepdad, so I agreed to do it for them. The first two days were fine. It was on the third day that this began. It was about 8.30 at night, and I had just made myself dinner, a lunchable, and was ready to sit down in the living room and watch TV for a couple of hours until I went to bed. The recliner I was sat in at my grandparents' living room was directly beside their large glass doors, and I could see into their backyard and into their ranch from my seat. Just past the fence of the backyard were about a dozen deer which wasn't odd considering there's an insane amount of deer where I live. I watched them for a second, when all of a sudden, I felt a wave of fear rush over me. It was like my brain stopped seeing the deer as something harmless, and instead, it became a very imposing sight. I scanned over the deer, and my eyes landed on one in particular. I noticed it, because even though it was a doe, it was a good bit taller than the others and seemed to be oddly bulky and slightly misshapen. I watched it for about a second before out of nowhere, its head shot up from the grass and it stared directly at me. I hadn't been moving and both my dogs were inside with me asleep, but I knew that it was focusing in on me. We stared for about a second before it started to whip its head around in a really unnatural motion. The closest analogy I could make 
is when a video game glitches and the head of a character starts moving around wildly. It did this for another second before putting its head back down into the grass like nothing had happened. At this point, I knew something was very wrong, and I knew I had to get out of there. I called my mom, who was out fishing with my stepdad, and told her I was going home early because I was freaking out. I suffer from anxiety and can sometimes have panic attacks, so she understood, and I hauled ass to my car. All I grabbed was my phone, my Lunchables, and an Eeyore blanket that I had brought from my house. I don't really know why I grabbed the extra two things besides my phone, but I wasn't really thinking clearly. I'm usually a very careful driver, especially on my grandparents' shoddy gravel driveway, but I knew I had to get off their property or else I would be in real danger. My car is shitty, with the driver's side window permanently down. The entire time I drove up their half-mile-long driveway, I heard a sound coming just off from behind my car. It sounded like if a mammal tried to replicate the sound of a cicada. Very throaty and unnatural, and it was the same constant distance from my car the entire drive off the property. Right in front of the gate before going back out onto the road were a few of my grandparents' cows. I laid eyes on a black figure amongst them, and almost like an optical illusion, it changed to be a full front profile on a longhorn. I wouldn't have thought this with my eyes playing tricks on me, because I was in a panic. If it wasn't for the horns. When I saw the quote-unquote cow, it was a black figure with no horns. But within a second I spotted it, it suddenly had two giant horns on either side of its head. I managed to drive home, but I still felt extremely unsafe. My instincts were telling me that if I went inside, I'd be cornering myself. At this point, I was sitting in my driveway, near hysterics, and on the phone with one of my friends, who I'll call Hope. Hope is extremely knowledgeable with this kind of stuff, and a true believer in the supernatural, and I knew she would be the only person who wouldn't think I was losing my mind. She talked to me, and calmed me down, and I explained the deer to her, and she got pretty freaked out and told me she knew what it probably was. I told her that I didn't want to know because I already had an idea as to what it might be, and her confirmation would only freak me out more. At this point, I made up my mind to go to my closest neighbor's house. I knew if I stayed alone, I would be putting myself in danger. So cue me crying and clutching an Eeyore blanket as I stroll up to my neighbor's backyard, weeping and apologizing profusely. Thankfully, my neighbors are saints, and they took me inside and calmed me down. They stayed up with me for a good hour until my mom and stepdad got home from the lake, and I felt safe enough to go home. Because I had finally fully calmed down, I decided to go back to the ranch with my mom to clean up the mess I had left when I booked it out of there. But by the time we were there, even remotely close to the ranch, I felt the panic return. We got halfway down the driveway before I told my mom I couldn't do it and I had to go back. My mom was still planning to go back after she dropped me off at home, but I knew she'd be in danger if she went back alone. So I told her about the deer, and I told her I really don't want her to go back there that night, and she agreed. Hope has an older sister, who is extremely well versed in the supernatural, and when she informed her of my experience, her advice was for me to never go back. This wasn't entirely realistic to me, since they are my grandparents, and I did leave most of my stuff there. But I tried to take her warning as seriously as possible, and decided to greatly limit my time there, and not to go back alone until my grandparents returned. The next day, which is today, at about noon, I had to go back to gather my stuff and check on my grandparents' diabetic dog, and let the bigger outside dog in, so he would be safe from the heat. The feeling of the place was still tense and strange, but not terrifying. Later, at about 8, I had to go back again, this time to feed the dog, let the other one out, and water the plants. I was way more hesitant about it, but my mom forced me to go. I was keeping my cool pretty well, until, as we were going down the driveway, I saw a deer standing in the road. I immediately felt the fear of the previous night and started freaking out, telling my mom that I couldn't do it and that she had to turn around. 
As I was freaking out with my mom distracted, trying to calm me down, this fucking deer arched his back. Like when a cat stretches. That tipped me over the edge into full hysterics, but my mom still refused to take me home. My mom went inside my grandparents' house and I stayed in the truck and called Hope again. I told her what I saw and she tried to calm me down, but nothing really worked. As I was freaking out on the phone, I saw a black shadow dart into and then out of the rearview mirror. That was it. I called my mom and was screaming for her to come back inside and take me home. Even during normal panic attacks, it never reaches this point, and my mom was screaming so harshly at my vocal cords hurt. She tried to convince me to come inside, and eventually, she decided to take me home, and I was hyperventilating and sobbing until the moment I arrived back. At this point, I'm terrified and I don't know what to do. I've never experienced anything like this before, and although I hope this is going to be an isolated sense of occurrences, I can't be for sure. For now, I'm going to try to stay away from my grandparents' ranch, but that really isn't realistic. I could use any advice you're willing to give. It was around 10 at night, off a little ways from Ocean City, Maryland. It was mother, her friend, and my sister and I. We were driving home from our vacation, and I asked if we could take the back roads. I always loved seeing the woods at night, and it was the scenic route. We were driving down, and although I was the one who asked for the trees, I was ironically on my phone texting and listening to music. We eventually came to a stretch of road that I didn't pay much attention to. It was boring. But I occasionally looked up every now and then, as I did the entire ride. It was a straight path forward, with nothing but street lights. So we were driving and driving, as we crossed under the lights, it was almost relaxing. I went into a half-sleep trance. Then I suddenly woke up, and everything was fine. More lights as we drove by. No one was talking. My mom's boyfriend wasn't asleep, but there were no muffled conversations. Everything seemed calm. But I had this sudden awareness we were in the middle of the woods. It was dark, and around 11.30 or 12. Without streetlights, you couldn't see anything but the stars. I immediately felt very paranoid. I turned my phone on and listened to the music. Then, we entered back to another stretch of light and drove on and I started to feel a little bit better. This part is strange, because it was as if something told me to go to my phone, as if there was a notification. I checked and there was nothing there, and then I noticed something in my obscured vision. There were about four lights up ahead that were turned off, in an area where the road kind of turns. It was a fairly wooded area, and you couldn't see much without the light. So we slowed down. I didn't pay much attention to it, but this next part sticks with me. As we slowly approached the next light that was on, something crawled out from the woods and into the light. I looked up and thought it was a deer at first, but it kept moving out. It was limping. But when it fully emerged, what I saw was truly bone-chilling. A naked, ash-white skinny man crawled out on all fours. It stopped, and as I saw it, it turned its head at us. Its eyes were deep charcoal black. We sped up fast and started driving. It wasn't human. As we drove past it, it jumped over our car weightlessly, defying physics. My mom's Mercedes had two sunroofs, and although it was a blur, I got a close look at it. As it passed over the car, it landed behind us and faded into the black. The scary part was, when it jumped over our car, our sunroof was open. My name is Carlos. I am now currently 14 years old. This sighting happened while I was backpacking in rural Arkansas, high in the mountains. Me and my friends, which for confidential reasons, I won't say their names, but let's call them Jerome, John, Caleb, and my crush who I will call Laura, went backpacking with my fellow church youth. 
On the very first day backpacking, I noticed how quiet it was. I mean, like the forest was empty, kinda. It was just silent. But I ignored it and put it off, as maybe it was just very quiet here. But being a country boy, I should have known better. After long and tiring five hours of walking, we finally decided to stop and rest for the night. I will explain how the surrounding area looked like, because it is important. We were separated into two groups, guys and girls. Us guys, we slept in a clearing near a massive hill, while the girls slept under a ridge of a cliff, and on the right of both camps was a river, also in between the camps was a ravine. Us guys, being young and stupid, decided to explore before it was too dark. We ended up finding this cave around 30 feet away from our camp. After exploring the cave, which was empty, we decided to go eat dinner. For some reason, we didn't make a fire. After eating, our counselor told us that we needed to have a buddy system when we used the bathrooms because it was hunting season. After the meeting, we went to bed. That night, I woke up with a strong urge to pee. Being the good friend I am, I didn't wake up any of my sleeping friends as I climbed up that massive hill to pee behind a tree or near the top. Now, I know that was dumb, but hey, you'd rather go pee in a ravine. Now, what sounds better? As I was going up, I heard a branch break, but I brushed it off as some kind of nocturnal animal during mid-pee. I heard a low growl. It was like a guttural growl. I was in mid-pee. I couldn't stop as soon as I finished peeing. I raced down the hill and made the mistake of turning around. I saw a massive, easily six foot tall, very pale humanoid looking creature with huge black eyes which were fixated on me. I immediately ran to my tent and passed out from fright. The next morning as we were leaving, I saw in that cave a pale looking face peering out at me. My friends didn't believe me, but one of my friends came up to me and told me that he saw it because he takes medication for his depression and he thought he was hallucinating. A few months back, I was on a routine third shift. I work as a police officer in a very small town in Ohio. It is currently the middle of fall. I'm not going to say where, people can find it pretty easily. Anyway, I was on night patrol, driving in my patrol car. Most nights, we are required to get out of our cruisers to check areas our cruisers can't fit. There is a super long, almost two mile bike path we are supposed to walk down. Well, one night as usual, I got out and walked the path. Usually, we do this to make sure no one is hurt or overdosed. My flashlight was dimmed during the walk, since I forgot to put it on the charger earlier that day. About one mile into the walk, I started to feel very strange. Not a typical gut feeling. A feeling that you know something is wrong, or something is about to go wrong. I began to hear leaves crunching, turning in every direction the leaves would break. My light is so dim it is hard to see much of anything. I continue trying to get this walk over. I start to speed up. In doing so, I must have triggered something's instinct. Every time I sped up, the breaking of leaves would get louder and continue with my pace. I get to the point where I know something is there, so I just stop and listen. I waited for five minutes, hoping to catch some kids playing a prank or a fellow officer trying to get a laugh. But nothing. The sounds have stopped. I began shining my light all around me, slowly turning my light from the tree to tree. Then I noticed something odd. I passed by it the first time. I shined my light back in the direction I noticed from earlier. I can see something, but at the time, it was hard to make out. The only difference I noticed was the contrast in colors, old gray and black with red and orange leaves and a brown tree. I shined my light up from it, then, two huge glowing eyes. Nothing like I have ever seen before. I have seen deer, wolves, and other animal eyes that reflect light, but nothing like this. I hesitated, almost drawing my firearm, but I stopped myself 
knowing that I could get myself in trouble if it was a prankster. This thing took one step out from behind the tree. I got a whole body view. It was covered in feathers, extremely tall and didn't appear to be completely human. I noticed it had hands like a human, but it having feathers that looked almost forced into the skin. I start to back up. Thankfully, it never moved more than what it did earlier. I was frozen in fear, too scared to move. But I snapped out of it when dispatch radioed. Police one, check up. The sounds of the radio snapped me out of my trance. I started walking backwards very quickly, not taking my eyes off this thing one time. It felt like forever, but I finally got back out of those woods. My cruiser was in the clearing. I bolted as fast as I could to it, not looking back until I got back in. I looked into the wood line from where I came in. Then I could see this thing's whole body, head shaped like a demonic owl, head laying tilt, just staring with its huge eyes. Its body, covered in some parts by feather, other by skin that appeared to be falling off, like it was rotting. Then a terrible odor came through. So powerful, it is engraved into my memory. I unlocked my cruiser, crawled in and locked my doors. I attempted to shine my spotlight and brights at it, but it ran back into the woods, letting out a scream that was like no other. I could feel the creatures below rattle my insides, leaving me almost sick to my stomach. After it ran, I drove back up to my station, sitting inside to recap what had just happened. I asked my fellow officers about it some time later, but got very odd responses. I was being told to never look where the noises came from. It would be better if I just ignored them altogether. I was confused at this point, wondering if they had seen it themselves, but I was never given a definitive answer, just told to keep my light charged and my eyes forward. If you enjoyed these stories, please hit that like button as it helps me out a lot. If you're new to the swamp, be sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications to never miss a new video, as I upload almost every single day on all things creepy and anomalous. I'll see you guys soon with another creepy video. If you have a story with a skimwalker or wendigo that you'd like to share in a future video, be sure to send it to the website or the email that you can find in the description down below.